Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining this event at SPY25. My name is Kimberly Peuling, and I'm joined here in the flesh uh, by Marjolein van Heemstra and Frans von der Dunk. And we're also joined here virtually, and hopefully in spirits, by uh, Alice Gorman. This evening has been organized in collaboration with Soapbox Journal for Cultural Analysis and will explore space waste in particular and outer space and earth in general because we cannot talk about space waste without these other two. Um, you may wonder what the deal is with space waste. I will start with a long personal story, so please bear with me. Um, once upon a time, I was lying on a remote beach in Australia. And Australia is a big country, so there's a lot of places without any or very little light pollution. Anyway, I was lying on this beach gazing up at the night sky and being baffled by how many stars I was able to see. It was as though I was looking at the Milky Way, but from outside of it. What I saw was a cloudy conglomeration of shining light spots of all sizes, all posed against a black and velvet background. It was a sublime and humbling experience. But my universe imploded when it was tactfully pointed out to me that I was not only seeing the delayed lights of dead stars' explosions, nor was I only seeing far-off planets, but that some of these twinkling lights were just sun rays bouncing off from artificial satellites back into Earth, and that some of these satellites were probably also dead, just like the stars that I thought I was seeing. The difference being that these stars are long gone, but these human-made objects are still there. It's almost as though they don't want us to forget. Through these flickering lights, they keep reminding us that they're there. And so I started to dig a little deeper into what dead satellites are and the dangers, like, oh my god, can one of these objects land on my head? Not really, the probabilities are less than getting stuck by lightning, so we're good. Um, but they do pose a real threat to our national and international infrastructures, because they rely so much on spatial technologies. And I find it mind-boggling that in just three generations, starting with the one of my grandparents, we've stuffed our orbits with so much material that it's becoming a problem. And we're in a rush to shoot even more stuff into space for various reasons. Think of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and the Virgin guy, Benson, I think. So now I'm going to get a little bit technical. Um, through its lifespan, an artificial satellite remains controlled and traceable. It circles the Earth in one of the three most used orbits. One is the low Earth orbit. That's where our imaging satellites and the International Space Station are located. The other one is a medium Earth orbit, which hosts navigation satellites. And the most congested one is the geostationary orbit which is an orbit in which objects move in sync with Earth. Our telecommunication and weather monitoring satellites are located in this object, in this orbit, sorry. But there are plenty of satellites that, for instance, due to malfunctions, stay in orbits, posing a threat to functioning satellites and other spacecrafts. Because in space, these uncontrolled objects are susceptible to space weather and other free-floating free particles. Wow, sorry. <laughs> um, these satellites have also been known to explode in space because of unused fuel, and so creating small particles. And these small particles are the problem because they are untraceable and move at hypervelocities of up to 15 kilometers per second. Their size and speed makes it difficult to anticipate them, which means that we can't move our functioning satellites out of the way. And, and the speed they travel, at the speed they travel, sorry, a collision with a one to 10 centi centimeter size particle, which is like this big, um, could potentially destroy a whole spacecraft. 
Because they are untraceable, the collusion chances increase drastically. The more collusions there are, the more particles are created, and so increasing the rate of fragmentation even further. So we get this cascading effect of collusion and fragmentation, collusion and fragmentation, which is known as, known as the Kessler syndrome, after Donald J. Kessler, who first theorized this phenomenon already in the late 70s, which is only just about 20 years after the first human-made object was shot into space. And all of this makes me wonder, what is the appeal of outer space? Which aesthetic and poetic forces draw us to space? And for this, uh, we have Marjolein van Heemstra here, who will give us more insights into this. Um, other questions I have are about how we should approach these objects. Can and should we reg regard them all as wastes? Or do some hold cultural value? And if so, who decides that? I am no expert, but Alice Gorman will illustrate this in a way better than I can. And lastly, other pressing questions are about responsibility. How do we hold the players of the field accountable of for their waste? The expert on this ground is Professor Franz von der Dunk. He holds the Harvey and Susan Pellman alumni Othmer, I don't know how to pronounce this, <laughs> chair of uh, space law and at the University of Nebraska's program on space, cyber, and telecommunications law. He is also a director of Black Holes, of, or the director of Black Holes, which is a consultancy in space law and policy based in Leiden, he, and has acted as a legal advisor or legal test manager in more than 130 projects, advising various government agencies and international organizations, as well as a number of non-governmental organizations and industrial stakeholders. Lastly, um, he has won numerous awards from institutions like the International Institute of Space Law, the International Astronautical Federation, and the International Academy of Astronautics. I'm now going to give the floor to Franz von der Dunk. Thank you for that very extended and kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me here. Uh, as you see from the title of my talk, I'm using the word space debris rather than orbital debris for a good reason to which I will come in a minute. Um, it's essentially the same bar for a small but not an important element. Now, many of you will probably question what the heck has law got to do with something like space junk or maybe even space at all. Well, there is something called space law. And in case you might wonder, that's the question that I often am asked when I'm talking at a reception to someone who is unaware. So many of you will not be aware of what space law is as well. I don't blame you. I'm going to give you a, sh a sort of crash course on what it is supposed to be. Before we go into that, you should understand the, the role of law in general. It, the law that we are talking about is, of course, human-made law. It's not the laws of physics. It's law made by humans. And it is meant to address human interactions and human activities, to guide humans in what they do, tell them what they can do, and tell them what they cannot do. And we usually think about that this is only about justice. Eh? And law is supposed to create a sense of justice, a general sense of fairness. But in actual fact, more often than not, the other purpose of the law is much more important. And that is simply a practical one to establish some level of predictability. There's nothing inherent more just, inherently more just than driving, uh, driving on the left compared to driving on the right. And some countries do the one and some do the other. And by the way, in outer space, left and right are interchangeable. They lost their meaning. So the reason why we choose either to draw, drive on the left side or on the right side is not because the one is more just or fair than the other. It's because we don't want to have road accidents every day. That is a very important element. Now, when it comes to space, um, when I want to describe the role of law in space, I'm reminded of a heading of a, of, of a New York Times article of 10 or 11 years ago, which spoke about the taxman, and it basically was the, the heading said, wherever you go, the taxman goes. And the idea was wherever humans go, wherever they undertake activities, the taxman will follow in order to try and taxman. <clears throat> 
Well, I tell you, you can delete the taxman and replace it by the lawyer, because exactly the same thing can be said of the law. The law follows wherever humans take act undertake activities, and this is no different for outer space. So that also means that the origins of space law in any meaningful sense of the word go back to 1957, when this small metal ball was launched into outer space. It was the first human-made artifact in outer space, and for the first time, it also raised some legal issues. For example, it was a Soviet ball which flew a number of times over the United States. Was that possible? Did the United States have the right to prohibit the Soviet Union from doing that? It was, by the way, and Kimberly already pointed that out, this also was immediately turning into the first piece of orbital debris, because within a few months it didn't even beep, beep, beep anymore, and it just uh, went on orbiting until it degraded and burned up in the atmosphere, luckily, because this was just a small ball, something like that. So 1957 also brought these questions to the table, and within 10 years, which is very short in an international law context, the first international treaty was concluded, which provided the framework for all of space law. The shorthand name is the Outer Space Treaty. You see the full name here on the slide as well. Uh, it talks about the principles on governing the activities of uh, states in outer space. And the word principles already points out that it's very broad, vague, general. There's not much really detailed law in it. And that is also a problem now with the issue of space debris. Obviously, I will come back to that. Now, luckily, at the time, this was 1967, there was a Cold War going on. There were just two superpowers who were really relevant. That was the Soviet Union and the United States. And both the Soviet Union and the United States immediately agreed to this treaty. And then everybody else followed suit. Eh? France, China, India, United Kingdom, Brazil, uh, Canada, every country which means something in space is party to this treaty. Which is a lucky thing because it means that we do have a generally recognized legal framework for outer space activities, even though, as I said, it's not very detailed in many respects. Now, for the purpose of space debris, space junk, um, I will briefly discuss the four clauses in that treaty which are at least closely relevant to the issue. The first one dictates that outer space is something like a global commons, which basically means that you can plant your flag anywhere in outer space, but it doesn't mean that thereby that part of outer space becomes your territory. You can never, you, a state, can never treat any part of outer space as if it was part of its own territory. And when it comes, for example, to heritage laws, which I know Alice Gorman is going to address, that is a key point to keep in mind. Second key clause basically tells, and of course these are my words, but it basically suggests to states, please do not uh, create much harm if you can avoid it. So try to avoid it, but that's all. That's not a very hard and fast legal obligation. So it only tells you, be careful, do your best to be very careful in whatever you do. The third clause is Article 8, which talks about jurisdiction or sovereign control over space objects once they are registered, kind of like it works with flag states of ships and aircraft, which become a kind of quasi-territory of that country in question, floating in outer space. And the last clause is Article 7, which talks about liability for damage. Very important. The, I would say, hardest clause in the Space Treaty, which is moreover elaborated by a later agreement, which basically says that every state that is responsible for the launch of a space object is then liable for any damage it causes. And that doesn't only apply to the space object as a whole, that also applies to any fragment thereof, which is very important when we start talking about space debris, which is basically fragments thereof. And we are talking about a full liability with no limits, so whatever damage you cause, that damage is what you have to compensate, which obviously easily can run into the millions or even billions. That said, so far nothing has happened, so don't worry about it, don't, don't lose a night's sleep. But it, in theory, it could run into the millions and billions. Now, I take a small sidestep because we should realize if we talk about space and the background to space law that traditionally there were three reasons for states to go in space. 
the, the most logical one was the military one, using space infrastructure uh, in the defense of your own country. And of course, in the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, that was of key importance. Kind of in a prolongation thereof, there was a lot of prestige involved, because the Cold War was about a philosophical fight between two political systems, and both wanted to convince the rest of the world that their system was superior to that of the other superpower, and space was a great way of trying to prove your point. And the last one was, of course, science, finding out all sorts of scientific and other interesting information about outer space itself, about dying stars, but also about the Earth. The point I'm trying to make is that space debris, space junk, was not on the agenda. No one really cared. Now, of course, that has changed, and of course, Kimberly has already briefly pointed out. You often see pictures like this. Now, this is greatly exaggerated. It isn't, it isn't as clogged as it looks here, but it is increasingly becoming a problem, and that, of course, raises the issue then, what does the law have to say about these issues? Now, I always tell my students that if you want to discuss the legal aspects of a key issue, you need to know exactly what you're talking about. You need to define the key concept, and that key concept in this case is space debris. What is space debris? Well, I think it's fair to say that we have now come to the conclusion that space debris is every human-made object in outer space, which includes in orbit, but can also be elsewhere, which is again why I use space debris rather than orbital debris, because orbital debris is a bit more limited as a definition, which is no longer serving a function and will not even serve a function in the future. So it is really waste in the colloquial sense of the world. There is no value to it in terms of its operation, which also means that it basically only presents a danger. Now, it includes uh, dead satellites, parts of satellites after fragmentation. It includes screwdrivers, which astronauts have just left uh, by accident uh, tumbling in outer space. And it can even include fuel drops. Everything that is left out there, or is a consequence of a space activity caused by humans, and has no longer any useful function, qualifies as space debris. What does the law have to say about that? Well, to go back to what I already indicated, there is no reference to space debris, not in the Outer Space Treaty, not in any of the follow-up treaties. So we have to really look for what is there. There is no serious obligation to address the issue or even try to address the issue beyond this fairly general Article 9, please do your best to avoid harm. There's no prohibition to create debris and there's no obligation to remove your own debris uh, to clean up your own mass. These are the two prongs, if you will, of fighting space debris. And that raised major issues when the Chinese in 2007 and the Indians 12 years later on purpose blew up their own, their own weather satellite. That was target practicing. They wanted to show that they were on a par with the old Soviet Union and the United States, that they could also shoot their own satellites and then, of course, other satellites as well, if it came to that, out of the sky. And the only thing they did wrong, actually, legally speaking, was not to inform the rest of the world ahead of time, because that was the only obligation, the only hard and fast obligation that Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty provided for. The US did something basically similar in 2008, but they did not make that mistake. They actually uh, informed the world a few weeks ahead of time and then went in, engaged in extensive consultations with anyone who was concerned about shooting down a US satellite in outer space, which could potentially cause damage on Earth. And, uh, and largely were able to dissipate those fears, but in the end they could still go ahead. So we are pretty much looking at not much is there right now. If we talk about the first prong, the mitigation, we luckily see something happening in the field. There's an interagency space debris committee, which is comprised of all the major space agencies, including, by the way, the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians, which started with guidelines where it was upgraded to a UN resolution, which carries more political and moral weight. And what you now see happening is that the standards in those guidelines are increasingly going to be implemented as part of licensing requirements for private operators in the national law. And those are binding. So we do luckily see something happening there. 
There are two protected regions which are of special importance. Kimberly referred to them already, low Earth orbit and the geostationary orbit. And in, in respect of all three, it's, remember, it's still a guideline. It's not hard and fast law, but they should prevent on-orbit breakups as much as they can. They should remove space object at the end of life, either deorbit and let the atmosphere do the dirty work, or if you're in the geostationary orbit, that's not a feasible option, so you shoot it higher into a graveyard orbit, and try to limit the release of objects during normal operations as much as possible. And then looking forward, cleaning up what is already there, because there is already so much there. ADR stands for active debris removal, which is technically already possible. This was a drawing from an ASPOT project, and that stood for an autonomous space processor for orbital debris, a kind of vacuum cleaner for outer space. So the idea was to capture, fragment, and deorbit space debris and bring it back to Earth. This was, on, this was on the drawing board 30 years ago. It has never materialized. Another project, just to give you one other example, was the so-called Temu Sweeper. The Temu stands for Texas A&M University, which had the idea to, to use a sling satellite, to, like a small uh, Ivanhoe, to sling the debris out of the way into a graveyard orbit or, a, or another orbit where it could do no or at least less arm, harm. Sorry. So technically it's possible, the problem is finances. It still costs at least tens of millions of dollars to launch, or euros, if you want, to launch anything of that nature into outer space. And the gain so far is fairly limited because you bring back, at best, a worthless junk. Although maybe Alice has something else to say about that. Problem is, first of all, that ownership and jurisdiction is for eternity. So you cannot take somebody else's satellite out of the sky, even if that's a dead satellite. And there are actually good reasons for that state owning that satellite not to allow that to happen. Um, there is no concept of abandonment, which is something that we, law from, that we know from the law of the sea. There is no concept like salvage rights, which we also know from the law of the sea. Uh, the, the problem is also that liability also remains into eternity, so if one state allows another state to take its dead satellite out of the sky and something bad happens, it's the original state which is still held to pay. And then these space objects often contain high-key technology. I'm pretty sure the United States would not like the Chinese to take a dead US satellite out of orbit because the Chinese might learn about the technology of the satellite. So concluding, there's enough work for us out there, which is, of course, very nice for those who study space law. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much for this very insightful presentation. Um, our next speaker is going to be Alice Gorman. And for the obvious reasons, um, travel limitations and the time difference between Australia and the Netherlands, she couldn't be here in person. But um, she has kindly, um, well, let us um, pre-record an interview, which we're going to show now. I have to mention, though, that her background is an image by the artist Kit, Kit Russell. And it was used as uh, the cover for a book um, called We by author Evgeny Zemyatin. Not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, published by the Folio Society. I think public participation in space is absolutely critical. And for me, heritage is one way to connect objects and places in space with individuals and communities. The bulk of the material that we have orbiting the Earth at the moment comes from what are called the, the spacefaring nations, which is a, a distinction in itself that I think is problematic. So the, the US and former USSR and Russia are the biggest contributors to the amount of space junk out there. So this is waste that is coming from a limited subset of people on Earth 
and among the people whose story is not told by this space junk and the objects and uh, the the communities that are attached to them tend to be uh, Indigenous people, uh, what are also called often developing nations, a term which is, you know, again, very problematic because it, it implies that all they have to do is try a bit harder to catch up and they too will achieve the status of the space very nations. Whereas we actually know that this is not a matter of not trying hard enough, it's a matter of historical colonialist ideologies about uh, the nature of politics and society in the world. So if we look at what's up in space, we can use these objects to tell stories about, you know, uh, the kind of triumphant narrative of the conquest of space and human ingenuity and the new narrative, which is about becoming a multi-planetary species. But it doesn't all have to be a positive story. And something we do in the heritage world is to look at who has been left out of the stories and what these things mean for them and put those stories back in. So you can say with some bits of space junk that they have been implicated in, for example, uh, military activities in different countries. They have been responsible for what's called digital colonialism, where the imposition of uh, effectively Western industrialist media has a big impact in Indigenous communities, often in remote places, who are exposed to advertising for the first time. So these things are, are part of the story as well. You don't just have to tell one story, and it doesn't have to be that very positive one. You can actually use these bits of space junk to unpack how space has become implicated in perpetuating divisions in the contemporary world, in driving inequalities that started on Earth and are now go going into space. So I think it's really important, and I think as an archaeologist uh, on Earth, we use material culture to tell the stories of people who didn't get to write stuff down. So it's not quite the same as that in space, but building on that project, it's possible to use this stuff to counter uh, the, the narratives which basically say that, that white Western science is the only way that humanity is going to go forward in the future. some space junk has heritage value and by that we mean it has significance and meaning for contemporary communities and so sometimes that is something we want to have a material record of but yeah we can't use terrestrial heritage legislation in space because the outer space treaty forbids territorial claims and extending a national legislation into space could be interpreted as a territorial claim. So we have this kind of tension, you know, between our desire perhaps to keep some of this stuff because of the stories it can tell and the connections to communities. But there's the structure that we need to do that is, is completely lacking. But you know, when we think and talk about space, we're often thinking about it as a fresh start or a new world or a potential utopia. So maybe this is an opportunity and I think also in a sort of a safe setting to just to test out some of the rules of the road for how humans are going to go forward in space. So I think the first thing is to build on what we know from Earth. And part of that story is, is about um, having multiple meanings for objects or, you know, allowing that something can have a positive meaning for one group of people and a negative meaning for another group of people saying, well, that's actually fine, that's okay. And maybe we should do this, but on a sort of a consensus basis. So, so make a list, you know, it's a tried and tested method on earth using heritage lists, but make a list, see what's on it, see what people care about and then take it from there. Think about what kind of mechanisms we could have 
that would allow heritage to survive in the event of an orbital debris cleanup. And maybe it doesn't have to be about deterrence and penalties, uh, which, you know, as, as law traditionally tends to be, maybe it can be about positive reinforcement. actually two things about space junk. So, so the first thing is like we use these words, we say it's junk, it's litter, garbage, trash, waste. These are all kind of words with negative connotations. And I don't wanna say that space junk isn't uh, junk or that we don't need to do something about it. But I also think we're kind of trained into thinking of it as a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always have to be that thing. So, so some of the other avenues to, to approach it in, I think, are to conceptualise it as a landscape or conceptualise it not as just a random agglomeration of objects, but as objects that have relationships between themselves and have relationships to Earth. So we can start to imagine it as a different kind of entity that doesn't necessarily have to be negative. It can be creative, it can be generative, it can produce new things. But the other key thing here is people can't see it. It's removed from our sensory world. I mean, you can see satellites and space junk if they're at a low enough orbit and you go out and know what you're looking for, but, but you can't see details, they're just dots of light. So that I think creates a big disconnect between what people think and feel and what they perceive, like that sensory engagement. That's what we call um, aesthetic value uh, in heritage terms. So to me, art and performance are critical in bridging those gaps. You can, you can bridge those gaps in, in a number of ways. So, so heritage is one kind of narrative to say, look at this object and how it's connected to people. Tech, stories of technology are another one to, to say, look, you know, we share uh, the components on this spacecraft that are in space are the same ones that we're using in Earth in different contexts. But I think the power of using artistic approaches, I mean, it is to just do the things that artists do best, I guess, just throw away the cliches and the assumptions and the trajectories that our thinking has been channeled into and present utterly new visions of what these things are and what they can do. And I think the creativity involved in reimagining these things is, is something of value in its own right. But it also creates, I like to think, like a, a cultural diversity. We're not stuck in those few dominant narratives that we've come to know so well, like the space race, the intervention of artists gives us new ones. Uh, it, it gives us a, a richer ecology from which we can kind of choose the, the things that particularly work for us or speak to us. And I think in the case of stuff in Earth orbit, because of that lack of, of visual connection and the fact this stuff is sort of absent or invisible to most people, you know, this makes it perhaps even a more fertile area for creative approaches. Well, I should say that in general, I am opposed to things being put in museums, you know, taken from their natural setting and put into museums, which people often assume is a good solution to helping protect something. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, is, is far from that because museums are some of the first institutions that will lose funding in, you know, the event of a national budget crisis or something. So museums are continually bat battling to stay afloat. So putting something in a museum isn't necessarily you know, a great outcome. I'm also not opposed at all to losing space junk. I mean, we need to get rid of some of this stuff. But there's so much space junk there that, that is, you know, it's twisted bits of metal, it's pieces of thermal blanket, um, it's detached 
uh, parts of the fuel system, it's, it's rocket bodies of which we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the same type. So if somebody wants to take some of those old rocket bodies, uh, like the, the one of the USSR um, Cosmos series, a name that was used for a huge number of things, and turn 50% um, of them into future space habitats or artworks or use them for fuel, then I'm cool with that. That's kind of a natural evolution of reuse and recycling of this material that has cost so much to get up there. The bit where I would become upset is when we're down to the last one and somebody says, well, this is junk, let's get rid of it. So we can actually make decisions about this stuff in a way that allows all these things to happen and doesn't diminish our heritage record. And there might even be some strategies which kind of enhance the heritage, the heritage of a piece of space junk. So reuse and recycling of satellites which still have some fuel and you can still communicate with them, uh, putting them to new scientific uses or new telecommunications or earth observation, whatever it is. That's a great strategy, not only for addressing the problem of space junk in Earth orbit, but also maintaining the place of that object uh, in connection to communities and landscapes. So a lot of reuse projects, I think, actually help the problem rather than being an issue of, you know, destroying stuff that we would think is precious. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't like anyone to not ask the question about heritage before they undertake some of these projects. Because there are a lot of ways to do things and having that information about the heritage value of a piece of space junk could be very useful for some of these projects. Elon Musk's red sports car is such an interesting object. And as I've argued, it actually has a social function, which is to be a symbol. And that's, that's its purpose. And so it performs that purpose very well. So it's technically not space junk, because as you know, many people said it was. But there is this weird thing at the moment whereby anything that has been in space sort of acquires this, these special qualities, acquires this, this aura, particularly if these objects come back to Earth. So, you know, there's a, a huge community of people who collect space stuff and space flown objects, you know, have the highest value. That could change in the future. So, so I don't know, 20 or 30 or 50 years from now, when we presume there will be a lot more going and coming between Earth and Earth orbit and Earth and the moon, people might not get excited about an object that's been in space in the same way. I don't know, that's just a prediction. But there's no doubt about that, that the returned object becomes talismanic, it becomes a fetish, it's like the focus, the physical material becomes the focus of, of all kinds of hopes and dreams and desires and I think that's really interesting and I think it will be interesting to see how that develops what kind of objects like at the moment the most mundane thing that has been in space will be you know sold for huge prices or, or treasured and cherished by someone who owns it will in the future will there be objects of higher status like will it have to be something that's rare that there was only one of the first moon colony artifacts, uh, stuff from Mars. Um, if people do actually get to Mars and ever uh, return or send samples or material back, will that stuff become the, the top of the tree for status and symbolism of things that have been in space? So I think there's, there's all kinds of interesting questions. Uh, and and this, this stuff kind of, it really shows the power of, we live in a digital world, but material stuff and objects and how we physically interact with them is still so much an important part of our lives. So, you know, we can, we can say none of us are going to get to see Elon Musk's red sports car in the flesh, as it were, again, 
but we can kind of partake of space when we acquire these little souvenirs of material, human material that's been in space. And the more people go to space, the more of this kind of material there will be. So it will be interesting to see what happens. Okay. We just uh, heard Alice Gorman talking about archaeology and cultural heritage. Uh, she is an internationally recognized leader in the field of space archaeology and author of the award-winning book Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, Archaeology and the Future. Her research focuses on the archaeology and heritage of space exploration, including space junk, planetary landing sites, off-earth mining and space habitats. In collaboration with NASA and Chapman University, she is part of a team conducting the first archaeological study of the International Space Station. Our next speaker is Marjolein van Heemstra. She studied a theology with the, arm, with the aim sorry, <laughs> of becoming an arbitrator. Before getting there, she got into theater, which led her to work as a poet, writer, journalist, theater, and podcast maker instead. Her poetry has won various literary prizes, and her latest novel has been translated into eight languages. Marjolein van Heemstra has been writing for The Correspondent since 2019. Her focus is mainly on space and how space can help us look at the Earth differently. In her more recent book on this theme, In Lichtjaren heeft niemand haast, which <laughs> I don't want to butcher, butcher, so I'm going to let you translate it, um, will be published later in May. She's this month, so. She's also regularly make, making podcasts in which she takes a listener along on her quests. I will gladly give the floor to Marjolein. Thank you. I think the title you would translate it as There's No Hurry in Light Years or something like that. But it sounds much better in Dutch, I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, so after everything we've heard here, um, I would just like to add some thoughts that can maybe point to um, a new mentality, um, a new Earth mentality towards space. I think um, the cluttering up of our final frontier is also a mentality problem and also a language problem, but I will come to that later. Um, and I think this new mentality could, could sort of raise awareness of this large reality of the cosmos that we as inhabitants of this planet are part of. Um, in the past two years, as Kimberly just said, I've been writing uh, a book. I've been making a space journey on Earth, visiting people and places that are connected to space and space travel. And in this journey, I was trying to understand how space can help us find a new perspective on Earth and on ourselves as um, inhabitants of this planet. Um, this book will be out next week, by the way. And one of the things I came to realize quite quickly when I started my journey is how little thought we give to the universe that we are part of. Uh, maybe not the people here today or the people watching, but in general, people hardly think of the cosmos as part of their lives. We are constantly focused on things happening at eye level and the majority of Earthlings hardly ever zoom out to see ourselves as part of a solar system or even a galaxy. As um, Alice Gorman just said, um, there is a, a gap between people and the space they exist in, or at least most people. And I think it becomes more and more important to bridge the gap because of all the de developments in space, the missions, the problem of space junk or space, um, what was it? Not junk, but we have to call it. The nee, the uh, heritage, space, her the heritage. So the junk and the heritage. And also our great dependency on space through all the satellites. If we don't bridge the gap between the common people or the non-experts and space, we will eventually just let it slip out of our hands and leave space to the space barons like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, the billionaires and the powerful national space organizations. If space is really a common good, we should have a common say in what happens there with as many different voices as possible. And if all these voices don't mingle in the discussions space will never be ours, will never be common. 
but we can only mingle in the discussions uh, if we feel connected to it and if we have the language and the courage to mingle. Um, as I think one of the questions had this sentence that um, the jargon, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, jargon, the jargon, the space jargon, is unintelligible uh, to the non-expert. And I agree very much to that after my space journey on Earth. Speaking for myself, I never really felt maybe allowed to officially have an opinion about space or spacefaring. I didn't understand the technology that brings us there. I still don't really understand it. I didn't know anything about the distances, about the physics, uh, about the, the laws up there. Space fascinated me for all my life, but in a way that seemed very alien to everything that we are actually doing there. Very alien to NASA, to ESA, to what Elon Musk is doing. It is the poetry of space that attracts me. The ancient human stories that we see when we look at star signs. The idea that we are surrounded by something unending and unknowable. But I always assumed a poet would not have a serious voice in the space, space discourse. Now, I don't really think that anymore after my journey. I think it's very important to seed and to nurture a new mentality when it comes to space and a new language. And I think poetry can play a very important role in connecting people to space in their daily lives. And I don't mean a literal poetry only. I mean a poetic approach to space, using it to open our imagination, using space to create space in our lives, in our minds, for wild new ideas. Uh, one good example of how this can be done, I mean, there are very many examples, but um, one I liked is a project that was initiated by Charles Coquel, astrophysicist from Scotland, I think he is. Yeah, you know him. Uh, it, well, he uh, collaborated with uh, uh, prisons in a program in which prisoners were asked to design a Mars settlement. And I forgot the name of the project, maybe you know it? Okay, that's an institutions for extraterrestrial liberty. <laughs> I really, okay, I really, really loved the project. I read the book that they made, um, and I love the way how experts in being stuck, the, the prisoners, uh, were so good at imagining life in a restricted environment as on Mars. Um, and I think this is a very a poetic approach to to something that we always approach very technically, like a Mars mission. I think it's very important to acknowledge that space is more than technology and science and also acknowledge it in the scientific and the technological worlds. So not just leave the poetry to the poetry, but let the poetry enter those worlds. The universe is made of stories, not of atoms, the poet Muriel Rukeyser wrote, and I agree. Imagination, poetry, poetic thinking, can be the bridge between common earthlings and space, just as well as technology or science can be. And highlighting this bridge will allow a lot more people to cross. And last year, I discovered the work of astronomer and poet Rebecca Elson. I have her book with me. Um, she died, I think, in 99. Um, but she wrote many beautiful things of, um, about how science and poetry could sort of interweave into something new. Um, on her notes on dark matter, she wrote something which I really love. Um, she, she was asking herself how to research dark matter, how to look at it, what questions to ask the dark matter. And she wrote, don't ask the questions you've been taught by science. Ask it everything you ever wanted. And she warns those with the power of science not to condemn poetry or the spirit, because curiosity, after all, is also of the spirit. So she sort of makes them into one, the science and the poetry. For many people, space is uh, someone else's story. Uh, Alice Gorman also um, reflected a bit on that. So it's a very exclusive story. It's a story that most people are only audience of. They don't participate. They don't add anything to the stories. They just watch in awe and that's all they can do. I think adding more spirit to the space industry and science 
can help us form new questions about what this region actually means to us, not only in economic terms, there's a lot of money to be made in space, but also in cultural and even spiritual terms. What does it mean to be surrounded by something we don't see and hardly understand? How is this part of our existence, of our consciousness as human beings? And how can we develop language to make it part of our conversations? Um, personally, I, I started this um, project in my neighborhood called the Night Watch, in which I walk um, with people from my neighborhood, my neighbors <laughs> mostly, uh, in the night. So we go into uh, this small city forest uh, around the corner and we just walk in the dark and we talk about darkness and about um, what we should be able to see, stars. Uh, we hardly see them here in Amsterdam. There's a lot of light pollution. But just reflecting on the stars, reflecting on the night sky, on everything we could see, um, on also on the things we see. Um, I. I realize really, or I, I notice it really opens up people and it gives a, a lot of conversations about space, about stars, about maybe future space travel that you would never expect to just have with a random group of neighbors. And for me, that's just um, sort of a pilot project to see if I can connect people more to this space story. Um, for now, my neighbors are very enthusiastic to go to Mars. So we'll see. <laughs> I would like to conclude with something I once read in um, Poetry magazine. Um, it's a um, collection of 100 years of Poetry magazine, of the best po uh, poems. And it it's, was um, a small part that I really loved. It talks about um, how the way a remote, invisible place um, like space is for most people in their lives, that feels very far from our daily lives, um, how such a place is connected to poetry. And one thing maybe, I, I, I don't know if I emphasize that enough, but I think to connect what I'm saying to what has been previously said, um, I think a thing like space debris, space junk, a problem like that, it can also happen because most people just don't know and just don't really care and there's no larger conversation about this problem. Um, so it's, it remains very niche because nobody thinks they actually own space or space is theirs. So um, I will read this part to conclude. And um, this man, he says, he, 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 we start in a, he just said that the discussion about um, uh, whether poetry is or isn't important is to him a very annoying discussion. The discussions always begin <coughs> with, with the assumption that because poetry, like space for most people, is not present in the culture in that way, say movies are, or even some literary fiction that captures the country's attention for a while, then poetry has no meaning for that culture, no effect on it. Never mind the fact that this is demonstrably untrue by some practical measurements, the circulation of poetry, blah, 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 he writes about how important poetry actually is, but that's not really the point. Whenever I hear this negative sentiment now, I think of the argument that roiled American politics several years ago about whether we, America I mean, should drill for oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Why not? We need the oil. The place being considered was so remote that it might as well have been on the moon. And as far for the breeding ground of the porcupine caribou, what the hell is a porcupine caribou? Drill, baby, drill. The strongest argument against this action was never, to my knowledge, spoken. Perhaps because it's seemingly the weakest. It's also completely apolitical. You don't need to know a thing about quantum entanglement, wherein one atom can affect another, even though they are separated by tremendous distance, to have some sense that our lives are always larger than the physical limitations within which they occur. We exist apart from our existences, you might say, in ways we will never be able to fully articulate or understand. There is such a thing as a collective unconscious, there is such a thing as a spirit of place, and it reaches beyond geography. And poetry, which is a kind of quantum entanglement in language, 
is not simply a way of helping us to recognize the relations we have with people and places, but it is a means of preserving and protecting those relations. So that's my uh, pledge for more poetry in the space discourse. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very enlightening plea for poetry and changing our language and the language, the discourse and narratives around space and space ways. And what I heard or what resonated with me from your presentations and uh, Alice Gorman's is that we, it, the space and everything around space, space technologies, has to be a little bit more inclusive, more democratic. Um, and I am wondering, in terms of law, for instance, um, Alice Gorman mentions, well, maybe we should make a list of all the objects that are, are important for us. But how feasible is this in law terms? Like, how how many voices can you include in law? At some point you have to make a consensus. Um, and you, all, you obviously have to deal with international, like national laws uh, that sometimes that differ. Like how feasible is this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the problems, if you will, is that today's international society is still organized along the lines of sovereign states. Uh, that's what the United Nations is composed of. Those are the sort of the visible entities, if you will, which do space activities. And of course, some states, all states are equal, but some are more equal than others. Um, but part of the problem is not only that, it's also that states are, the, are just a rough representation of humanity. Of course, there are many people that are not or do not feel represented by their state because they are a minority in the state or a suppressed majority even in some cases. Uh, civil society has a problem in getting hurt and to some extent artists and poets are part of that problem. And unfortunately, I don't see that readily changing, at least not from the legal perspective, because the whole idea of law is to run through existing legal fictions like states. International law is still comprised of states agreeing on how to behave, on what to do and what not to do. And the best thing you can do as a civil society is to try to influence states, and that can happen. I mean, it is, it's, not a, it's not a lost case by all means, but it takes, it takes a certain in, incentive. And whether a list could be made which really reflects the interests of humanity as a whole or the various composing parts, if you will, in neglecting whether they are one country or another or one, one, one people or another, is, is, is a major task in itself. Um, I have another issue with the list, and that is, what do you want to do with the list? I mean, you, everybody can make their own list, and, and, and if you go, you know, if you put on your television, you see all sorts of lists passing by. Um, the problem is, what do you want to do with them? Uh, do you just want to say, these are important? Okay, what do you then want to do with them? And I think it's important to, to realize um, that, you know, if we talk about these things in outer space, we must distinguish between things happening on celestial bodies, on hard pieces of rock in outer space, where something can remain for a long time, even though it may seem useless to us, like the footsteps of Neil Armstrong or the crash sites of, of certain uh, robotic missions. Um, there are efforts to preserve those as heritage for mankind. And although there is still legal issues, you can put them on a list. If the states agree, you can then say, okay, this list deserves uh, particular attention, preservation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, the UNESCO has, has done a great job in listing all the World Heritage Sites. You can do something in theory on, on the moon and other celestial bodies. What I have much more of a problem with is that you also apply it to the other part, which is the, where we usually use the word space, junk and space debris, that is floating around in outer space. How do you intend to, even apart from the legal problems of which I raised some and Alice raised some others, 
how do you intend to make that work? Um, these things, as long as they are up there, uh, and, and as I said, definition of space debris is that by definition they are useless, so they cannot be translated back into an operational satellite because then there's not, they are not space junk, and I think that's, that's something that we might start doing. But if it's really useless, do you really want to let that go just because it's reflecting some heritage idea when it continues to be a danger? Do you stop trying to, uh, to, uh, to contain a disaster like Chernobyl because you want to show the world what can go wrong if a nuclear power plant explodes? No, your first, I would say, your first need is to actually make sure it does no more harm. And then you can start discussing, should we change it to a heritage site to present a warning finger to humanity? Let's not do that again. And as long as these uh, space debris is floating, to me, that's an operational, uh, an operational um, uh, <laughs> nuclear operator. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going a little off tangent, but this is, this is kind of the issues that you then have to address when you talk about lists. Yeah. Um, very interesting that you are addressing the tension between heritage, like preservation, and... Uh, the hazards that the objects an sich poses. And I was wondering and thinking what you think about this, Marjolein, because we could maybe take one of these objects that hold a lot of cultural value out of this environment because it poses a threat to other satellites. How, but how can we still, through language, through poetry, retain the the value of it can we even um, or does it I, change? I don't think I really have an answer to that I haven't I had never thought of this before I heard Alice Gorman talk about it that you would well see it as heritage I think is a very interesting perspective but I have no idea what the risks are or how so I, I can't really answer that um, for me, what I'm trying to address is the idea of how we define space, how we, how we let space, what kind of role it has in our lives and in our society. So um, I think that's more of my angle. Um, what I am very interested in is what you just mentioned, how you, um, um, how you handle the things on celestial bodies. Because I read quite a lot about plans to make uh, natural parks on celestial bodies, which I think is very interesting. But I was always wondering, is that legally possible? Do you mind if we... Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great point. And actually, of course, again, going back to my earlier point, if the main states of the world agree that that's a good thing, then you can absolutely create an, a natural park. And as a matter of fact, Antarctica, which is often compared also in a legal sense to outer space, because it's also supposed not to belong to any single country. In under the Antarctic Treaty, they have agreed to establish certain zones, and actually now all of Antarctica is basically a zone where you can't do any mining activities, where tourism is only allowed under very strict um, conditions in order not to preserve the very pristine and, and, and very uh, sensitive ecosystem which is there. If you, if, if you kill the moss, it takes 50 years before it brings back to life, just because of the highest environment. So you can certainly transplant that to, to outer space. And what you see currently happening is, for example, that NASA, which is concerned about private initiatives where somebody might run a rover straight through the footsteps of Neil Armstrong, uh, is trying to convince the rest of the world, whatever you do, please stay out of that zone. They can't do anything else than asking, because the moon is not the moon is not um, uh, part of the United States. So they can't just use the US state government authority to keep everyone out. They have to beg for understanding. But that may lead to something like a natural park. If you allow me, this discussion also triggers another element. And I was particularly fascinated also by what Alice said about um, developing countries and people, uh, people uh, not feeling part of that. I want to give a little bit of a counterpoint to that, because in particular, uh, when in 1969, 
the US astronauts were the first to step on the moon. This was by many considered not to be so much a US effort, but this was humanity stepping on another planet. These astronauts made a trip to all other parts of the world, including the East Bloc, their, their political opponent, and, they were, and including many developing countries, and they were really celebrated as, as heroes. So people who had never anything, any sympathy for the United States in particular, saw those people not so much as reflections of the United States, as, as representations of humanity. And another, and if you talk about heritage, um, the, 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 we, we spoke a little bit about the possibility, if you want to really preserve something, you might wish to bring it back, right? Interesting. Which, which costs tens of millions, but sure, if it's, if it's the International Space Station or something you really want to preserve, that might be an interesting feature. Of course, sometimes stuff comes back of its own and survives re-entry. And there's a funny story when um, in a very remote part of South Africa, which when nothing has ha happened for, for 100 years, a, a three meter piece of space debris from, I believe it was a, a US rocket, fell. And the local people immediately said, hey, this is interesting. This can get us tourists around here. So we build a museum around it. So, uh, again, as a kind of counterpoint to many of the points that Alice said, there is not necessarily an absence of, of, um, of um, how do you say, identification also of many other people with what's going on in outer space. I'll stop there because I've been talking too long, sorry. I, I, really, I really like that point of uh, them building the museum around the object rather than placing it in an already existing institution that has a lot of like social, political, and cultural uh, backgrounds. I don't know if that w that's what you wanted to. No, address. no. I just I just wanted to add a tiny thing that you might think or that we can consider in your counterpoint to Alice Gorman's point. Is my counterpoint is yes, of course, people um, applauded these astronauts, but I also think that the whole identification was on a quite a superficial level because. They were so much, there was so much PR going on. People had to love them. And I think there are a lot of examples, for example, the civil rights movement who, who actually, they came at, in, at, to uh, Cape uh, Canaveral and, and uh, uh, demonstrated against this moon uh, operation. There were a lot of voices that were not heard in history that were very much opposed to them. So. I think this is also the story that we have inherited, that everyone, it brought, it united everyone, maybe in a way, but underneath the skin, I, I wonder how, how many people actually identified with that. Just, I mean, it's, you know, yeah. just to. Yeah. A good uh, feather point, yeah. Yeah, um, that actually ties into the next point, uh, which was that of care and matters of care, um, because, you talk about poetry and how poetry and language can bring us together and bridge certain jargon or language gaps. But at the same time, I feel like poetry is also something that is seen as quite intimidating and scary to some people because, oh, I don't understand it. I don't get the meaning of it. How, how then can we translates do it do we should we be concerned about translating poetry is it, is it more an effective and emotional connection that you're trying to build through poetry i do I, as i said i don't only mean literal poetry i'm i'm interested in a poetic way of thinking or a poetic approach so i think for example the project i mentioned that uh, charles coquel was involved in is very poetic because you address people that are stuck and you ask them to think about another way that we might be stuck in the future and how to deal with that. And I don't, I don't know about these inmates, whether they read poetry or not, but I imagine they didn't all, you know, they weren't all poets or interested in poetry, but they, in, they were interested in this project because they were approached in this way and, and they were asked to think about themselves and about space and themselves in relation to space in a very different way than ever before, I guess. And it's the same way if I talk with my neighbors, they are not at all interested in my poetry. 
but they are interested in the sky, in the night sky, and in darkness, and because it's very elemental. It's something that, that human beings have done for millennia, so it, it's very inclusive. Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, then uh, what you're basically arguing for is the celebration of this ambiguity, right? Yes. The, 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 the different interpretations and understandings and, and experiences that we can have around uh, space and space exploration. Um, but this becomes a little bit difficult when we extrapolate it to, for instance, law, because you were talking about um, how there's uh, this article in the Outer Space Treaty that says that nations and their um, technologies shouldn't do any harm. But it's that term is still quite ambiguous. What, what harm to who and to what? Um, how, and, and are we talking about harm to living beings or are we talking about harm to the environment? How, there's so many gaps and kind of loopholes in this, uh, in this phrasing, which becomes problematic. So while it is, and it can be very productive on a more personal kind of uh, social and cultural aspects, it becomes this ambig ambiguity becomes very problematic in law. How would you, how could, could law address this, especially this, this article, for instance? Yeah, the, the, the sort of the easy answer is that law is a human product and therefore by no means flawless. It's, it's a living thing in that sense. Uh, that's why the 67 treaty is a treaty of principles, so it is very broad. And the hope is that over time, the more we understand about how space works, what the interests are, and not just the financial and political interests, although they usually take precedence, but increasingly also more broader precedence of, of how, to, how to be inclusive and things like that, um, that at some point it all transpires into efforts to then build further, more coherent, more, more straight law. But uh, you're absolutely right. The original idea of the harmful interference was harmful interference with the activities of other states, which is a very limited sort of harm. So the idea of causing harm to the environment as such was already mentioned there, but not really seen as very important. But we talk about 67. The Club of Rome hadn't even produced its report on, on, on that you know, uh, natural resources on Earth are, are limited. Uh, the whole idea of the environment, except for a few far-sighted people, was nowhere on the political agenda. In that sense, we've come a long way, and that is also starting to translate into, into space. Um, and there's other areas where space has to make up. If you talk about the inclusivity, of course, it used to be f just two nations. What we do see is more nations, including some of the leading, what I call, for want of a better word, developing ones. Uh, of course, it used to be very much a rich white man's privilege. And Neil, Neil Armstrong spoke about a great step for uh, a giant, uh, sorry, a small step for a man. Now we should say for a human. Well, okay, the United States is now pushing for the first female astronaut to be put on the moon. And Apollo is now going to be Artemis, which is the female companion of Apollo. If you talk about poetry, there's a little bit of poetry in there, if you will. Um, and another just comes off the top of my head. One of the most poetic images, images that I've ever seen was made by one of these hardcore military astronauts, and that's called Earthrise. There where you see the small blue marble rising over the horizon of this bar barren field of the moon, which only gradually people realized what an incredible impact that has. I mean, obviously the US space program was financed largely for military and prestige purposes. These guys were all, were all uh, test pilots, you know, the, the triple A guys who, from Tom Wolfe's uh, novels, uh, the, the, the hard guys never show an emotion. And they took a picture which has became iconic for the whole idea that Earth is a vulnerable, small planet, that we shouldn't spoil it. So in that sense, there is some poetry already there. The key is that these people who experienced it were never trained to express themselves in words, because they were all engineers. 
uh, they, they were they didn't have the idea okay if i see something beautiful how can i make the rest of mankind experience that as part of, of, of an important part. That's and it was also a byproduct of something else they were doing. Yeah, it, it was, was an meant accident. To, absolutely. Yeah. So but it had this funny very... How, yeah, it was very impactful, yeah. but it's funny that it was just a, a, it was a coincidence. Yeah. So serendipity, if you will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, yeah. Well, I think, um, I fear that we have run out of time, okay. <laughs> um, which is uh, very sad because there are still so many questions and things to discuss, but unfortunately, time is not on our side. Um, so I want to thank you both so much for your insights and for coming all the way here. Um, and thank everyone back at home uh, or wherever you're watching. And yeah, hopefully until next time. Thank you. Thank you.